Yeah. Seven o'clock, Chris. Okay. Um, before we start there, Kim, what's your last name, please? Hello, Kim. I guess they're not willing to speak. So we'll start the meeting. Uh, we'll start to call the meeting to order for Monday, August 10th, 2020. We're not at the Steel Community Room. We are live on Zoom. <clears throat> and like always, the first thing to do is to approve the agenda. Anybody that wishes to add to it or change it? There's uh, one addition that we need to have, Chris. Um, Alyssa is um, scheduled to give a uh, economic development director's report tonight. That's per the MOU from between RW and the town. And uh, we simply forgot to put it on. Uh, she contacted me last, <clears throat> last week to tell me that she had it ready. And uh, I just forgot to give it to Carla. So if you could put her on, probably under the select board item somewhere will be good. Yeah, I just did. Yep. Nothing else then? Okay, with that change, I take a motion to approve the agenda. Hi, sorry. Um, I was gonna ask about um, an opportunity to um, get an update on the encampment um, off Snow Street in 100. Encampment, can you be a little more specific? You know what she's talking about, Bill? Yeah. And she can do it under public, Chris. Okay. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> All right, I'll take a motion to approve the agenda. Mike, you gotta unmute, please. I make a motion to approve the uh, agenda as amended to add the two, the encampment uh, issue and the economic development issue. Okay. Second. Second. 80 seconds it. Further discussion? All those who wish to approve, say aye. 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 Consent agenda items, just minutes from August 3rd meeting. Take a motion to approve the consent agenda. I make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Let me second it, please. Second. Okay, Nat. All those who in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, public. Uh, Ms. Wilkins, go ahead. I just wanted to get an update and see how we can um, get some resolution with the encampment. The individuals there have um, been shooting guns, and so there's a safety concern with that because it's coming to the backyard of homes with children. Um, and then the other side is Route 100. The other concern is that there have been fires going um, regularly in there. Um, and we have been in contact with the state police um, and it's on state land. So there was some confusion about who is responsible. Um, so yeah, I'm, not sure the select, I'm not sure the select board knows too much about this. Um, Ms. Wilkins lives on Seabury Place. That's correct, isn't it? Correct, yes, thank you. Yeah. So Seabury Place, for those of you who don't know it, is off of North Street, which is the Half Moon Road on uh, North Street. When you come down the hill, North Street uh, goes off to the right, and then there's a private street called Seabury Place that goes up the hill. And uh, there's uh, some residential properties up there and Seabury Place and the, the last property is back up to the Thatcher Brook above the falls, above um, the grist mill. And evidently there has been, um, I suppose homeless people maybe, uh, for lack of a better word, that have camped there. Uh, this is unbeknownst to anyone until last week or so when uh, Ms. Wilkins called here to the town clerk's office. Um, 
as she said a minute ago, uh, she and a couple of other neighbors have uh, have suggested that they hear gunshots. Um, I don't remember what time of day that was, but, but um, uh, you know they've they've called the state police. The state police have uh, gone to the site. I spoke with uh, a sergeant from the state police last week, and uh, the people are accessing this area from the Route 100 of Thatcher Brook. So if you can envision where the old off ramp is coming off of exit 10 from Montpelier, that's being used for storage by um, McDonald right now in the Main Street construction. There's a you know, a slope up the hill there, ledges, and they're accessing this area by by the Route 100 side, getting up in there, and evidently they're camping. Um, the state police, as I indicated, have been called. Uh, I talked to the state trooper on Wednesday last week and indicated, and, you know, he indicated to me that they went to the site, they saw evidence of camping there, they did not encounter the individual or individuals, and maybe Ms. Hopkins knows how many there are, but I haven't seen them. Um, and they scoured the campsite, and he told me they didn't find any spent shell casings. Now, that does not mean that there's not shooting going on there, it just means that he didn't find any evidence of it, except for calls from the uh, people over on the street side of the brook. Uh, the property is state property. It's owned by, uh, it's interstate and Route 100 right away. So it's VTrans property. I asked the state trooper if, uh, you know, VTrans could be uh, contacted. I have not been able to contact VTrans yet. So I, I don't have any update on that, Ms. Wilkins. But, uh, you know, if trans would issue a, a notice of no trespass, then the state police could push them out of there. Now the, the state the police were called again over the weekend because several individuals were seen going back up the um, 100 side of the river into the encampment. And I, I understand the state police were there um, again, but oh, as okay. of a few minutes ago, the encampment is still there. Yeah, so you, you know more about it. I didn't know the state police went back over the weekend. Yeah, the other neighbor um, that lives in 10 Seabury Place called because he was home and saw the people climbing up the opposite side of the bank from his home to okay. above. And I think the challenge is, and this is a challenge that we face as society everywhere, is that uh, you know, there are no, uh, no strong laws uh, about uh, being homeless and camping. Um, we don't have any ordinance in the town or the former village that speaks to it. The village had an ordinance that prohibited uh, discharge of firearms within the village limits, but there's no village anymore. Uh, I do not believe the town has uh, an ordinance such and, uh, you know, if we want to consider it, we'll have to talk to an attorney to figure out how we write the ordinance, because I assume nobody's wanting to say that nowhere in the town can you shoot a gun. But uh, you know, the ordinance that the village had was for the village specifically, and there was no discharge of firearms within the village. Um, even if, even if the police found them shooting a gun right now though, uh, they could probably talk to them and probably, you know, a little bit more forcefully than, than I'm talking right now, could probably make a statement that they ought not to do that. But I don't believe there's any law or that, um, that prohibits it. So we're in the classic situation and I saw Ms. Wilkins on the, uh, on Thursday last week, Thursday or Friday downtown, and we chatted for a little bit. And this is another one of those situations where um, we don't have anything on the 
works because we've never really had the problem. Now it's here and what can we do about it? Um, even if VPNs issued a, a, a notice of no trespass and the state police pushed them off of there, they wouldn't arrest them for it. Uh, and then they just move along somewhere else. And I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't try to move them away from this neighborhood, but um, it's not just, uh, you know, you can do something and the problem just goes away. I've also told the state police trooper when I, uh, when I was uh, contact, when I contacted him last week, when we were talking about this situation, that I've had a couple of complaints about a homeless person in Rusty Parker Park. Uh, down here on Main Street. Now that park, there is an ordinance there that says the park closes at sunset. So if they find somebody in there, they could they could move them along. But again, it doesn't mean that they're gonna, you know, relocate them from town or put them on the bus and you know take them to New York or something. So that's the that's the issue. Um, and I did tell Ms. Wilkins that I would try to contact VTrans to make them aware of the situation. The state police, I believe, already have. So uh, that's the update for right now. And just so you know, the under the letter C on the manager's items where it says issues for consideration at future meetings, this is one of the issues that I was going to bring up under that under that uh, heading. So that's where we are right now, Philip. I'm glad to hear it was going to be discussed, and I think um, I don't know how to officially, but I think the town um, and uh, should should get some kind of ordinance back um, to protect those of us. I, you know, I'm concerned about the safety of people around here. Um, and there is no way for me to protect myself. That you know, I call the police, and I'm told that I am hearing potential. And I'm hearing fireworks, and it's not. So, you know, we need to have some somebody that is able to protect us. Lisa. I, um, I was just wondering if um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Mayor, the town, is she still the town? She's not, okay. But um, she is connected with a, a group that uh, works with people who are homeless in all of Washington County. And I don't know if she might be able to be of assistance or have any resources that maybe could be offered to these individuals to assist them to uh, maybe relocate. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna obviously take the hard nose approach and uh, cut to the chase here. Uh, if we have the ability, uh, the authority to implement uh, an ordinance that says no homeless uh, encampments at all in the town of Waterbury. That's the route I'm going to want to go. Over. I don't think you have that authority, Chris. That's unfortunate. I, I don't, you know, um, as I've said before, the, the municipalities in Vermont can only do what's authorized by state law. And I don't think you can make homelessness illegal and I don't think you can just make a blanket ordinance saying that you can't be homeless in Waterbury. Yeah. Well, we probably shouldn't get any further into the weeds on it then because all it does is up my blood pressure. Um, well, Mrs. Wilkins, thanks for bringing it to our attention. Uh, as of tonight, nobody had known of anything about it, at least from the board. I don't believe Mike you got a question yes I do uh, I'm as as concerned as anything uh, homelessness is a problem uh, it is a problem where you do see encampments I am concerned that you know if they're as much as I'm very pro pro gun uh, guns need to be used in a safe and responsible manner and one I would like to be you know somehow we need to find out if it is absolutely gunfire versus fireworks because sometimes sometimes people can confuse the two you know i know a lot of people i'm not saying someone doesn't know one from the other but yes it's how, so confusing how are you going to find that out mike what 
How are you going to find that out? Are you going to go up there and inspect the place? Because I'm not going up there. Oh, no, I would say the state police would. We have a contract they, with us. They've been up there yeah. at least twice or three times. Have they been up there in the evening when their people are going to be sleeping? That would be the time. That would be the time to, you know, if they're going to go during the middle of the day, they're probably doing their business. And to me, if they go up at, you know, nine, ten o'clock at night, that's the time where they're probably going to encounter the folks. And if there's any sense of guns there, you know, they could speak. Hey, we, we can't be shooting there. And the whole issue of getting them out is, is a whole nother issue. You know, we have to figure out, you know, where is a more appropriate thing, the applicable, you know, mental health and or homeless uh, advocates that, that may be able to help these individuals. Well, the state needs to recognize first and foremost that percentage of those homeless people are homeless because they want to be. And when, until they acknowledge that, this problem's going nowhere. Okay, we need to move on. Thanks, Ms. Wilkins. Uh, you could join us at the next meeting if you'd like, and have, you probably have more input by then. Um, okay. Good luck and uh, eye out for your kids. Yeah, don't sit in my living room. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I, our hands are tied. Obviously, you know it's, uh, it's, and it, things are just continuing to get worse down here. Chris, I'd like to say something. I, I, I would say that I'd be, I'd be in support of looking at the village um, ordinance surrounding gunfire and that map, and wondering if we can maybe use the former village map and reinstate that to not only help with this, but just to create some safety for the density of the, the former village. Sure, and I, you know, obviously this discussion will also take into consideration uh, residents, taxpayers, gun owners' rights as well, you know, but if we can somehow um, something together that, that uh, solves the problem that Mrs. Wilkins is dealing with, and, uh, it'll be a good thing. But certainly look at it, Mark. Anybody else before we go on to our next thing? Okay, thank you all for that. Thank you. Select board items, uh, discussing the fall recreation program. That must be why Nick's here. It is. Yeah, you wanna take off thank of it, you. Nick? So uh, before Nick starts, um, I did send an email to the board members uh, around five o'clock tonight. I hope you all saw it, but Nick, uh, Nick sent a memo out that looks like this that I sent to all of you at five o'clock. So if you haven't looked, try to find it, but go ahead, Nick. Yeah, so uh, the we kind of, alluded to at last meeting, but uh, since the school district has implemented a four day um, out of school, one day in school instructional model, um, that leaves a lot of parents in the community wondering what they're gonna do with their kids uh, for four of those days. Um, but now a lot of parents are back to working unlike the, the, the spring when uh, everyone was kind of shut down. So, um, we kind of put our heads together and came up with a program that uh, seems to work all around, fiscally, staffing-wise, and for the community, which is the most important. Um, basically, we'd operate out of the rec building. Um, we can hold 15, 16 kids in there uh, with the COVID regulations. We technically can hold 22, but or 25, but we, uh, I think we're gonna cap it around 15 or 16 to make sure that there's a uh, just enough social distancing just in case the regulations change. Um, the rec building has Wi-Fi, it has heat, running water, bathrooms. We have a, a little kitchen. Um, so uh, it covers the needs, uh, the basic needs for kids for childcare um, throughout the day like a school would. Uh, additionally, we're gonna staff it with some of our uh, staff that are currently in college to become teachers. We have two staff that are uh, senior and a junior that are doing their student teaching and they're gonna use this as part of an opportunity. Um, additionally, Keith McKenna, our pool director and uh, day camp director this year, he's a, a licensed teacher uh, through, he has no uh, 
it's the young he has the the license through k through 12 basically um he's not going to be running it because he's going to be teaching for the moral union supervisor union but he's uh he runs our off-season lessons on sundays so he's he's uh available to consult if we need to um but basically this program would run 8 8 a.m to 1 30 uh monday through friday with two staff on and then i would hop in and out as needed so i can still work on my other off-season duties um and uh, we would do the same check-in procedures like we do for rec uh which are in line with the child care uh regulations that the state of vermont has issued uh, hemp gun questionnaire vis visual signs um uh, additionally we'll add like a, a little release every person that registers for rec chris uh, karen they um you have to sign a digital waiver we'll add we're going to add to that the covid uh just a little covid bit i'll work with vltc on that but um they'd put something out a little bit ago that we could use for after school or in school um child care program but basically in order to sign up for this program you'll need to abide by that like you would our day camp handbook it's going to be kind of like that um it's $25 a day and you can sign up for every day if you wanted to um, that your kid's not in school. Um, the stipulation is uh, unlike like a swim lesson you can sign up for and pay later. Uh, we require the $25 for that day, the time of registration in order to hold the spot. Uh, that way it alleviates people blanket, like the spots are very limited so it, it alleviates uh, folks blanket registering their kid for 14 weeks and then the week of being like oh we found other child care and um opening that spot up to someone but uh, last minute who uh, yeah so we would require the 25 dollars then um that way people are registering for actual spots they actually need and not just taking a spot for the entire fall um and then picking and choosing what days uh, they give up um so nick let me ask you real quick yeah. so you're saying that every time i think you lost me there a little bit um they got to register and pay the 25 dollars every day is that what you're saying wait can you say it again chris it cut out oh are you saying that they have to pay the 25 dollars every day daily when they show up with their child they they'll have to pay it online or pr like pr prior to coming to rec that day they'll have to to pay it you're saying you can't pay ahead you're muted bill yeah nick is the one that seems to be cutting out a little bit right now um when we sign up for rec people are able to sign up and make a down payment and then they they pay later for this summer recreation program. I think what Nick is saying is that whatever days people sign up for, they need to pay for it when they sign up for it. So if they want to take all 14 weeks, they've got to pay for all of those days when they sign up for it. Uh, the expectation I think that you have, Nick, is that people will be signing up um, kind of in a variable way that they'll sign up for this week and then next week they'll sign up again or what are you talking about yeah they'll that's how they would theoretically sign up is uh kind of like a few weeks out in advance that they know that they definitely need child care for those days and, and want the remote instruction help um but yeah that's that's the idea the the challenge of course is two things one um we have space for 15 kids or so and uh you know there's there's a lot of kids that go to school and there's probably a lot of people that uh, might have a challenge finding uh child care and we're also charging 25 dollars a day uh it's not a full day but five and a half hours i think um which is a very reasonable price from you know, the perspective of parents that have to pay for this. So I expect demand is gonna be pretty high and you may have people signing up for the whole thing right at the beginning because what, where are they gonna get $25 a day um, care? 
So, um, I guess that's where I lost Nick because I thought I thought that you weren't able to sign up for the whole duration uh, in case you decided to pull the plug. Yeah, you could you could sign up for the whole duration. Um, yeah, just you need to you'll need to pay for it. You'll have to front. pay for the whole thing up front. Can I, can I ask a yeah. question? Being a user, the the school situation is evolving so quickly. Would it be beneficial to do sign up at the beginning of each month, based on changes that can occur even monthly at the school? Because we could in October be in school two days a week. And I've signed up for Mac and prepaid, and then now my child's in school that day. Just yeah, we thought. we would offer a refund. Oh, okay. Yeah, we would oh, offer. I, okay. I, I want to prevent the like what what's happening right now is I have the extension camp registration happening right now, now, and so if we do every month, you're gonna have 15 people fighting for those spots, you know, or so. Um, whereas if it's fluid, people can sign up as they go. They don't have, feel like they need to, to pay for everything, like sign up for everything at once and pay for like, they'll have to pay for it. But that way there's just not a frenzy and then people emailing upset. They can see what's available, what's not available. Um, I was going to say the only could open up. So understood. Understood. I was going to say the only risk with that is, uh, <laughs> you snooze, you lose, you know? Um, but there's a lot of people been asking about it. They kind of know it's on the radar. Um, it's going to be popular. Yeah, there's nothing else you can do, um, you know, when it comes to something like this. It's just there's too many people that need those types of services and not enough services out there. So you, you know, you're going to have your hands full, Nick. Mike, you got something? Yes. Is that, you know, my impression that, 15 won't even come close to what the probable demand is. Maybe I'm wrong, but does Nick have any kind of clue as to, you know, I could see 50, 100 kids potentially needing that service. Because, again, a lot of the school-age kids, parents won't have that infrastructure of know who, who are in daycare because it's just so used to having their kids in school. So do we have any kind of clue as to what the – potential demand is because 15 is not a lot of kids to serve yeah so i sent out a survey um a survey monkey a couple weeks ago asking about the extension camp and then this and almost everyone um that responded it was like 80 or 90 of the of a uh, of 100 and something folks i sent it out to it's a crazy response rate it's really good um said that uh they either checked yes they would be interested or uh like yes they would definitely sign up or yes but they want to just know more of the details which i've worked out um for this meeting the the hours the cost uh whatnot um there's, less than 10 said no so there's no triage based upon need that you know folks that may be able to afford other options you know can can do so i that's that's where where I go, it's kind of. I know it's probably going to be first come, first serve. Yeah, we we really don't we really don't have the infrastructure to figure out um, need based stuff. Uh, it's hard to get that information even from the school. Right. Uh, and at this late of a date, it's really it's really not possible for us to do that. You know, it's a you know we a couple of weeks ago we had the uh, final public hearing on the community center, and obviously you know we don't have it you know, and it's a huge cost, but, you know, here's a place where there's a, there's an obvious need right now. Um, and we've got, we've got the ability to deal with 15 or so kids right now. We've only got the one venue and, and it's limited um, in numbers because of the COVID restrictions. And it's also limited because you need to have enough staff to watch the children. And uh, again, at such a late date, it's just hard to shift all the gears that you need to to accommodate 50 or 75 people, Mike. Totally understand. Space, space is the biggest one. Um, we could hire more staff for this, but it would there wouldn't be enough room for it. So um, 
yeah, we'll see what the need is. So far, so it's not like it is. Nick's, Nick's proposal did show, you know, a, a little bit of a projected budget. Even at $25 a day, it looks like this will probably break even for us um, at, at worst. Um, so unless you have other questions, staff's recommendation is to have you make a motion to approve this so Nick can start working on it and getting the word out. I make a motion, Mike. Muted, bud. I would recommend to uh, a motion to approve the Waterbury Rec uh, School Child Care Supplement as presented in the um, memo by uh, Nick. I'll second. Okay, any further discussion? I just have a question. Uh, Nick, did you ask any of the schools if it if they'd be open to letting you use their space, like even one day a week or anything, like one classroom or a basement? Yeah. Yeah, there. Um, I'm on a board with the one of the co principals at Thatcher. They're they're just like I'm telling people I'm not renting the rec building out this fall because of this program. They're they're letting they're letting people know the same exact thing. They they're very uh, precautious and, and have to maintain uh, um, a certain level of security for, for safety. So. Go ahead, Mark. No, sorry, that's background noise. Okay, you are not all set? All set, thank you. Motion has been made and seconded. Um, all those who wish to approve it, say aye, please. Hi. Hi. Good luck, Nick. It's too bad we didn't have space for in staff for a lot more kids. I know. We'll, we'll try it out. We'll see how it works. Thanks, Nick. Good Love job. Luck. Thank you. Thank you very much for all you've done, Nick. No problem. Thank you. Melissa, you want to chew on our ears for a bit with a report from the Economic Development Director? Hopefully it's a little more pleasant than chewing. I'll do my best. <laughs> um, I did, you all should have an email probably a little bit above the memo from Nick um, with kind of the more formal report from the year. So certainly follow up if you have specific questions. Um, I guess I would just start, we revisited, you know, the formal MOU that the town has it's with RW, which funds economic development services, which RW implements through hiring me to be the economic development director. Um, we really appreciate the support. I think that you all have shown to the organization through um, funding the position, particularly right now and giving that flexibility with the PPP. And I also really appreciate the support on things like the tent ordinance and outdoor seating and kind of some of the other stuff you all have supported. So I just wanted to start with that kind of thank you. Um, this report was over an interesting time frame because it's from January of this year, basically through July. Um, so in January, we were doing business mixers where we crammed 40 to 60 people in a small contained space, ate appetizers, socialized, um, because that is kind of what the role looks like then. Um, thinking back to kind of some of the planning overlap, um, obviously I'm a big fan of the planning commission and try to be pretty involved in their work. So there was a, a process over the historic overlay district and providing some input on that. But um, since Mark, obviously you'll see the bulk of the report is really around kind of COVID response um, and kind of pivoting. Initially, our concern going into March was Main Street reconstruction and meeting one-on-one -on -one with, you know, some of the businesses in downtown and figuring out how to support them. And um, I distinctly remember a conversation with Dave and Lynn at Blackback probably a week or two before the shutdown. And they said, you know, yeah, we're pretty worried about construction. There's also this virus thing. We don't know about that, but, you know, two weeks later, obviously we know what happened. Um, even since March, I think the role in terms of the support I've tried to provide in light of COVID has varied. So initially it was really, you know, we had the executive order from the governor and what does this mean for my business? You know, am I considered an essential business? Can I be open right now? How can I be open right now? Am I allowed to do curbside? Um, 
Mark, obviously, who's on the call, was actually a big part of putting together a really nice partnership that we've continued with Stowe. Um, obviously, we share a lot of similar business categories, whether it's restaurants, lodging, and so there was a big group um, of folks. The first call, we maxed out Zoom at 100 people, and people couldn't get on because so many people wanted to talk and share and find out what the updates were. Um, Teresa, again, who's also on the call, and Tom Stevens, who was here earlier, um, were great about kind of providing legislative updates, particularly when they were in session and things were evolving and changing. But we continue those calls um, twice a week for probably two months, down to once a week, um, and we just stopped them the end of last month. But just offering an opportunity for businesses to really collaborate and connect, you know, is every hotel in the world buying new pillows? Um, has anyone had problems with this particular application? Have you gotten this federal funding? And then that opportunity for us as well to share information. So I spent a good portion of my days on the webinars offered by you know, the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, Department of Taxes, um, unemployment, like you name it, I probably sat through a webinar and then was working on providing that information out um, both to a list of over 200 businesses in town and on those calls in terms of, you know, some programs you needed to pre-register in order to be eligible, um, or here's the types of documents you need to have in order because this grant program is first come first serve. So how could, you know, businesses get ready for that? Um, you know, right up front, it was a lot of who's open, who's providing what services, how folks in town could support them. Um, but, you know, continuing now, I'd say we're probably on kind of the tail end. Um, there is a couple of still financial programs. Um, some of this is now some of the state programs that are using the federal CARES money and helping to kind of spread that out further. Um, so, but again, there's a fair amount of money on the table for those who qualify. We know there's some gaps in terms of um, folks who opened recently or some um, thresholds in terms of how much businesses lost. So those can be challenging. But again, as recently as like last week, um, you know, you can find out that, oh, someone didn't know about a program or was mixed up about the guidelines and like they might be eligible to, you know, like 10 to $15,000. So, you know, the hope is just supporting people in, you know, how you're eligible and have you applied and doing a lot of that follow up has been just trying to get folks to take advantage of um, as much as they can. I say, you know, I hope you don't qualify, but if you do qualify, I want to make sure that you're getting, you know, as much financial assistance as you can. Um, you know, despite a pandemic, we are a little more normal now and there is, you know, the ongoing work around um, available spaces in town, um, folks moving in and out of spaces in town. So, uh, you know, I'm always a resource for people who want to move here. Um, you know, we had someone who I'm moving to Waterbury from Burlington and I have a business and I might want to relocate it. So looking at places for that person um, or just, you know, high I've heard of the area or I'm interested in a particular space. What does permitting look like? Um, that's all, you know, kind of standard support I provide. Um, I guess I'll give kind of like a, a brief overview, um, not wanting to speak for everyone, but just because I think I'm going to get asked. Um, you know, I would say right now the community has been pretty fortunate in terms of businesses, um, at least for now, being able to kind of hang on and stay open again between the patchwork of federal, state, local support. Um, I think it's too soon to tell where we're going to be ultimately. You know, I think it's it's hard for folks to plan for the future, and some of those folks who have managed to stay open or reopen partially aren't necessarily doing that at a sustainable level. So I would say, you know, the good news is we've had pretty minimal um, business closures or loss thus far. You know, I can think of like maybe a half dozen, and they were all kind of solopreneurs. Some folks are still running a business, but they aren't renting commercial space in town anymore. You know, they decided that was an expense they could spare. So there's been a couple of those, but you know, thus far we have been fortunate, but um, I hesitate, you know, I don't wanna be pessimistic, but I wanna be realistic that, you know, the numbers I'm aware of in terms of revenue for a lot of folks is not gonna be sustainable long-term unless there's, you know, an intervention probably federally candidly with the amount of funding they would need. Um, but, you know, we're continuing to just stay in tune. Um, it's been really fortunate to have Teresa's involvement in particular. Um, she's the board chair of RW right now, but being able to kind of filter up business needs to her um, has been great as well. Um, 
that kind of wraps it up for just some overview. I'm happy to answer any questions. And I guess the last other note I would say is we are doing some work on just um, recruiting more folks for the committee. Um, we call it the Waterbury Area Development Committee. You know, Bill and Mark are both involved in it, but I just wanted to mention it in terms of if any of you folks on the select board know of community members who are, you know, chewing your ear off about business needs in our community that we'd be, you know, I'd be happy to talk to them about the committee and our work and um, we'd love to have their input, you know, as those folks help to kind of guide and advise me on how we can be um, most beneficial. So yeah, happy to answer any questions and thanks for the couple of minutes. Alyssa, I had a, I had a question and this might be appropriate for also Karen and maybe uh, Teresa, but um, prior to this whole COVID thing, um, we had a, um, a few different businesses that were looking to get into Waterbury. Um, and um, just wanted to kind of see what your radar was on, on businesses that might be looking to uh, invest in the downtime um, and are still, you know, uh, looking to get into Waterbury. I would say there's certainly a handful. I'm not entirely sure what you're alluding to. I don't know if it's um, Darn Prep and the like. I will say, fortunately, they are still um, on track for their office space in town and have had you know, a small number of folks here. Um, in terms of kind of bigger investments or people looking to grow, I can't say I'm aware of any on the horizon, um, kind of on like a major way. Again, kind of there's always the flurry of smaller offices. Mm -hmm. And out, um, but the water continues to have the appeal it did before. Um, it's more, I think, in general, we're seeing fewer folks who are um, working in offices. There is one case I know of where someone wanted, you know, X amount of office space and was kind of prepping that before this, and now they've come back and said, actually, we'd like half of X because yeah. <laughs> you know our employees want to work from home, you know, two days a week. Um, so certainly that's an impact. I think we are fortunate in particular um, with the state because the state office complex was owned by the state. Obviously that's not you know, going anywhere. Um, and the other state employees in town, um, that contract was signed pre-COVID for the space that they have in Pilgrim Park. So that's all been positive, but um, yeah, that's a general overview, which is to say there isn't any kind of major new developments I would say that are drastically different than what there was pre-COVID. But people that were on on board prior to this are, are, you know, major, major players are still, still around. Yes. Great. Thank you. The other thing I wanted to mention, Alyssa just alluded to is the, um, we are reaching out to the agency of human services in particular around um, the Waterbury State Office Complex, and uh, I think probably people heard on the news last week that the governor said that most employees will be working remotely until um, the first of the year, and that deadline keeps getting pushed out. It, it was Labor Day, and then now it's moved to the first of the year. So, um, you know, just so you know that we are we are um, reaching out to those folks to see, you know, what what are the future what are the future plans and. Um, I don't know if everybody had seen, but the Commissioner of Buildings and General Services is moving on um, next week, essentially. And um, there was uh, there was in the Capitol bill the um, authorization to tear down Wasson Hall. Um, and at, at one point, the the state was looking to tear down both Stanley and now. Uh, Wasson after the road construction is done and and potentially build additional office space there. But I think I think that we probably won't see that. I think there probably will be uh, some sort of mixture of remote and on-site um, space and potentially um, space sharing. Um, you know, given that they have moved to remote working fairly successfully for for most positions. Um, but they're not going to abandon the state office complex. But I just think that we will see it be used in different, in different ways going forward. I think you'll see more um, co-located space. You know, people sharing cubicles, things like that. You know, people working, you know, two days at home and three days in the office, or vice versa. You know, there, there'll be more of that going on um, when things do start back up here uh, in town. So we also just wanted to reach out to them to let them know that. 
Um, we're here, we're ready. Our businesses um, really want uh, and need those state employees back working and uh, working in town. And um, so we hope that happens uh, sooner rather than later. So Teresa, with the, the fact that the state is going through such economic difficulties with the COVID prior to the COVID, uh, and now with the COVID um, and with the transition of, you know, workplace in these buildings like the state complex and the ability to work from home, you haven't heard any discussion about possibly um, any kind of cost cutting savings when it comes to either possibly leasing out part of those state buildings that aren't being so heavily used and consolidating into areas that, you know, if you got a number of people staying at home, a number of people are working in house that don't require the space that they have now, uh, reducing that space and either leasing it out to other types of businesses um, or somehow divesting themselves of properties they don't need. Mm -hmm. I think I think that what uh, would more likely happen prior to something like that, Chris, would be that the state would uh, further reduce any leased space that they currently have um, and move additional state employees into a uh, office sharing kind of situation down at the office complex. So there's still a number of employees in Williston. Um, and that was, you know, one of the groups that were slated to move um, to Waterbury at some point in time. And so I think you would see people, um, the state reducing the amount of leased space. Uh, as Alyssa said, um, they had previously just prior to COVID um, had signed a lease in Pilgrim Park and uh, obviously, uh, you know, if that lease arrangement had been starting in March, that lease probably would not have been signed. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, we're all going to see changes with regard to how um, this affects work environment and workers and how they, um, how they commute, um, whether it's physically or if it's telecommuting you know, we'll, we're definitely going to see changes in practice. The state has not been uh, much of a, at least in the agency and human services, I should say, from my past experience, had not been much for telecommuting. Um, and that obviously had to change um, rather abruptly. And I think that they are seeing some, you know, benefits to, to some of that. And so, you know, like, like the rest of us, I am sure that state government is going to adjust um, as, as we recover and, and try to return um, to business, um, you know, during and after this pandemic. Um, so, you know, long answer, but I think that the, the first priority would be to reduce their leased space prior to subleasing any kind of space that they might have um, that, they, that they own. Well, at least they're moving in the right direction. Yes. Yes, and, and, and in fact, uh, you know, had we not had, uh, had we not had, uh, you know, March and business shut down uh, for the last quarter of the year, we, we, the state budget actually would have had uh, probably a near record setting surplus at the end of this year. Um, so the state coffers were actually in pretty good shape. And considering that we have been in a pandemic since March, um, you know, we ended the year without having to use reserves. So um, that's that's good. That's good news for the state of Vermont. A lot of other states are not in that situation. Um, that's a whole different topic going forward and we don't need to get into all that legislative stuff, but going forward, uh, you know, the year that we're in right now is a much different story, so. Second question. Hang on just a second, Mike, and I'll get to you. Second question, um, any one of you could probably answer this. Somebody asked me it the other day about um, Main Street reconstruction project. Is it on time? Is it, are we gonna meet the timelines that we 
originally were supposed to meet or are we lagging a little? Like to chime in on that? My first response is I always defer to Barb Farr for questions regarding Main Street reconstruction. Yeah. <laughs> um, but my guess would be as far as I'm heard, it's moving along well, Bill, if you have further. Yeah, details. we're, um, I don't know absolutely specifically, Chris, but um, <clears throat> McDonald has had a pretty good year so far. Obviously they started uh, about a month and a half later than they would have liked. Um, they had a lot of practice last year. They have uh, hit far fewer water mains um, than they did a year ago. Uh, that's right, Alyssa. Um, so, you know, last year there was a lot of scrambling around uh, trying to deal with those kind of issues. They've had a season under their belt. Um, while they had a delay in starting, um, from their perspective, the lack of uh, people in the downtown has been a, a good thing. So, uh, you know, if you think about a year ago, uh, especially Thursday, Friday, we had lines of traffic, out, you know, across the bridge into Moortown uh, and it was tough getting through. And it's a shame that it's not that way right now, but for the construction, it has been a little bit more of a, uh, smooth sailing. They haven't had those traffic issues to deal with. So I think that um, the last that I heard that they're pretty much on schedule. Um, to remind everyone, it's supposed to finish up uh, June 30th, a year from now, next, next June 30th. Um, we'll see how far they can get into the, into the winter this year. Last year, they worked right in until December. Uh, if they get uh, that again this year, I think they'll be in pretty good shape. The biggest challenge um, <clears throat> that we're going to have, and people really should know this now, is that <clears throat> the utility poles in the section that uh, the utilities are all going underground, those will probably not be removed uh, by June 30th next year. I shouldn't say probably. There's almost no likelihood that they will be all removed by June 30th. Uh, we're hopeful that all the utilities will be underground and that the cutover will have taken place, but uh, the utility companies can't come in and remove those poles while McDonald is still working. So uh, we're gonna have to live with, uh, with that reality for longer than I think people expected when, when this project started. We're working with the utility companies, McDonald's, and VTRANS to try to make sure that uh, fires get lit under the right utility folks so that when the time comes where they can start removing those aerial facilities that they'll start doing it quickly. But I think we're pretty much on schedule, Chris. I was just concerned. I mean, our businesses in town are obviously facing two problems. One is the reconstruction project and the other one is the COVID thing and the sooner we can eliminate ourselves at least one of those, it, you know. Well, unfortunately, I think, COVID, I think COVID is much more detrimental to the businesses than the construction right now. I mean, it wasn't fun last year and business certainly probably slid a little bit last year, but uh, I think there were a lot more crowds in, in uh, businesses and especially restaurants last summer than there have been this summer. So oh, Mike, go ahead there, you had the question. Quick question for Alyssa. Uh, you mentioned in your report about uh, some UDAG consults. Have those consults resulted in any applications or any activity? No, not thus far. This was more folks. Um, there's been two actually relatively recent with new businesses. Um, one who's considering moving to town, one that was starting a brand new business. Um, and so it was more just that this is something that's available and kind of like a lot of the things, you know, I try and joke icing on the cake, you know, we want you to move to Waterbury regardless, but if you're going to be here, is this a way to tie in with that? So no, there hasn't been any forward progress other than um, that it's a piece of the package. I think in both cases or in two of the cases, at least I know, um, at least I think from Bill and Aoife's perspective, the hope would be it would be in collaboration with other funding. Um, for two of them, I've been working with um, 
federal SBA actually does have some incentives because of COVID um, through the end of September. So if we're able to get them um, small business financing, essentially, there's some, they'll make six months of payments, basically. So I think that would be the ultimate dream. Um, but yes, in terms of those three inquiries, there hasn't been anything um, further aside from the action that the five commissioners took, but that was not new loans. And again, Bill's really the mm -hmm. point person there. Yeah, the, the three the three uh, potential borrowers that Alyssa has alluded to, Mike, uh, I've been in contact with them. Uh, there's there's one pretty active one right now. Well, actually two, uh, and uh, we'll see where it comes down. But uh, the district still has its UDAG fund. There are funds available to be to be loaned right now, and uh, if we can get those out the door and help somebody open up a business, uh, we're doing what we can with it. But frankly, you know, the last year. Um, since about this time last year, there has been more activity, more inquiries about UDAG than there had been for probably three years before that. Uh, the utility district financed one big loan last year and made two substantial loans, uh, one late in 2019 and one in early 2020. And uh, I've had uh, four inquiries now this year. One of them to me about three weeks before the COVID crisis struck, and they've just kind of disappeared from the face of the earth as far as any communication with me right now. And I, I can't go into detail who it is, but you would all know the business. But it's just a, it's a challenge right now for for some of these that had plans to expand and uh, things were looking very rosy and, and it just kind of uh, at the drop of a hat all kind of dried up for them. So we'll see where it goes. And I'll just add, though it is obviously EFUD's funds and not yours, it's definitely great to have, you know, there had been a whole legislative proposal that, you know, Bill was involved in and brought to the EFUD commissioners and they approved, which didn't actually move forward. But it's just to say, I think the state is aware that there's pockets of money like UDAG and is thinking about if there's ways to maybe leverage some of the federal um, CARES money to help get it out there in a way that works. Because, um, you know, adding on Bill, there's been a lot of activity and not to put my own feet to the fire, but I think figuring out a way to support um, more of the lending without it all falling on Bill's plate has been something that's been talked about and I think continues to be something that would be great to do just so that it's not me saying, here's the you know typewritten version of the 1996 UDAG loan docs, but it does exist and please come talk to me about it. Um, but just, it's an asset for the community. And I know some communities either don't have a fund or have it all lent out to one person right now. So they're just not in the position to even to discuss lending. Right. So the, the EFUD commissioners are meeting on Wednesday this week. And uh, as Alyssa suggested, you know, the Scott administration uh, a couple of months ago had made a proposal uh, to try to um, use these revolving loan funds. The state was, his proposal was for the state to guarantee loans, to, to guarantee interest payments. And, um, you know, that's something that the legislature just could not uh, buy into for a variety of reasons, and the legislature passed something a little bit differently. Um, historically, the EFUD um, UDAG loan has been restricted to within the village limits. Uh, the commissioners have already agreed to uh, lend uh, in the entire town of Waterbury outside the EFUD district if there were a business that wanted to use it for that. Uh, frankly, they're going to be talking on Wednesday with the um, director of the Central Vermont Economic Development Corporation, of which the town is a member. Um, and he's trying to kind of uh, use what the legislature did in the Scott administration proposal. And, um, you know, maybe there, there'd be an interest in using that money to, to lend to businesses even outside of you know, if there's a business over in Moortown on the other side of the bridge that might need some help, um, we've got a revolving loan fund. So we're, everybody's trying to keep an open uh, mind about how we deal with 
the needs in this in this new environment that we have understanding that you know keeping a business going in more town that comes into waterbury to to buy supplies or to come in to just you know have a business lunch or something is maybe a, a good thing to do so uh, it's a whole new world in economic development and we're trying to use the tools that we have uh, to use them to the best of uh, the advantage to the community so that's where we are right now okay then we're all interconnected that's for sure um mark nat you guys all set Yeah, Chris. I uh, <clears throat> oh, good. Uh, I just before you move on to the next topic, I just wanted to in my changing hats now in my hat uh, as president of the RW board, I just wanted to um, say thank you to the town to the select board for the um, continuing uh, support of revitalizing Waterbury during this time and recognizing the vital role that we play in supporting our community businesses and um, just our overall <clears throat> um, uh, vitality of our community. So, um, it, you know, knowing that the, the town took, you know, many steps during these last several months to reduce expenditures, and we uh, appreciate the fact that um, revitalizing Waterbury was not on that list. And um, hopefully you continue to feel satisfied with the work that we're doing to support uh, not only our downtown, but really our whole community. So we just wanted to say thank you. Yeah, I was gonna ask you both there, you and Karen, uh, if you had anything further to say. And uh, I just wanna let you people know that uh, your organization is very important to the town of Waterbury. It's a, it's a part of a, a big issue that, you know, quite frankly, if it were in the select board's hands, everything that you people do, if it were in the select board's hands, I don't think it, truly get the uh, attention that that you guys give to it um, being a separate organization so and it's a uh, very very um, you know it's a, a great organization and I think it's very important to the survival of the business in the town and I know we all appreciate everything you guys do but we don't perhaps all see it uh, we know that you work hard at it Chris, I'll say um, thank you for that. And pretty much I've been quiet here, but mostly because Alyssa uh, has it totally covered and is able to answer your questions well. Um, revitalizing Waterbury's mission is very broad. It's preserve, promote, and enhance the economic, social, and historic vitality of the town for residents, businesses, and visitors. Economic development is a huge component of what we do. There's so many other pieces. We get a lot of support from the community and we get a lot of support from the town and we really appreciate it. Um, I think we can all honestly say we love what we do and we love the town we live in um, and we work in and we work for it. And so we're just doing the best we can. Anytime you have questions or need help or need something, reach out to us. We're here to give a hand. We all set then, we can move on to our next item. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Yes, thank you. So it's uh, manager's items time. Setting the tax rate, oh boy. Something we all like to do. <laughs> You're muted, Bill. I'm happy that we're able to uh, take it up tonight um, as of 4.15 on Friday, it didn't look like we'd be able to do this because we hadn't received the information from the state. It finally came um, very late on Friday afternoon and I emailed you all on Saturday after I came in and, and worked on things here for a couple of hours. Um, and then this morning uh, was told by Carla that the Department of Taxes sent us the wrong information. Um, which meant it had to be done again. Um, unfortunately, the information that was wrong was that they had just flipped the homestead tax rate and the non-homestead tax rates. And, uh, you know, they're within a couple of uh, 
ten thousandth uh, places of each other. So it it wasn't a major issue. It didn't really change anything very much. Um, the the non homestead tax rate went up um, about four cents. Um, no, it went up about eight cents. Um, and uh, if it could have been a lot worse than it was. So anyway, this afternoon I sent you out a corrected sheet that looks like this. I sent you two of them. One um, has the homestead tax rate and the non-homestead tax rate at 1.7368 and 1.7314 respectively. Uh, my recommendation for the municipal tax rate is to set it at 51 cents, which is the same as it was a year ago. Um, if you remember at town meeting, the voters gave the town the authority to set the tax rate up to 55 cents. Uh, for a variety of reasons, none of which involved COVID. I had recommended that we set a tax rate as opposed to approve an amount of taxes to be raised. And given the fact that the voters went along with that, uh, it allows us a little bit of flexibility. Um, late this afternoon, when I sent that last email out to you, I sent two versions of a, of a budget uh, they update what I went over with you in May when I made my first projections uh, about the new budget with uh, COVID in mind. Um, and either way we do it, I think we have the ability to um, set a 51 cent tax rate. Uh, I know that that uh, dampens or diminishes the amount of money that we're gonna take. It, it, it gives away, if you will, about $305,000 to the community that we would otherwise collect if we set a 55 cent tax rate. Uh, that $305,000, of course, uh, will impact our budget. Um, but I think given the steps that we took to uh, reduce expenses, both through cutting back on some of the projects that we were going to do, uh, some of the supplies that we were going to buy, and most importantly, by uh, furloughing a number of people, uh, we have the ability to uh, pretty much withstand that. Um, one quick word on the budgets before I let you ask questions about the tax rate. The two that I sent you um, on the upper right-hand corner of the first page one of them shows a $42,747 deficit, and the other one shows a $301,587 deficit. The one with the smaller deficit, $42,747, I've updated the revenues based on what I think we'll probably receive this year. Um, as I said in the email, this tax rate that I'm proposing is 51 cents. The one that I, we talked about in May was 50 cents. So that gains about $76,000 for us. But um, I, uh, everything else about what we were doing going forward with that, with that particular budget stayed in place. So in that one, we withheld uh, about $245,000 worth of transfers to CIPs. And if we don't make those transfers or don't make all of them as we had originally budgeted, I'm thinking that we come out with about a $42,000, $43,000 deficit. The other one that shows the $301,000 deficit, um, I, that one made all of the transfers to the CIP except a $5,000 transfer from the Parks Department. And I just wanted to see if we kept our obligations to ourselves and put that money into the CIPs as we had planned, where we would where we would end up. And that would leave us with about a $300,000 deficit, which if we had to uh, 
get that back in one year, which is not necessary, but if we wanted to, that would add about four cents to the tax rate next year, just by itself. Um, the last thing I wanna say is that I believe some of the revenue projections that I have in both of these instances um, are a little bit conservative. Uh, for instance, where it's, we budgeted $208,000 in pilot payments. Uh, both of these budgets still project $156,000 of, of pilot payment to the general fund, plus some to the highway fund. I think we're probably gonna get all of our pilot payment in 2020 that we had planned upon. Um, until the check is in the bank, I'm not gonna promise that, but I've left these projections of state transfers where I projected them in May, thinking worst case scenario. So the pilot payment, the forest and parks payment, and the current use payments, I think they're all gonna be better than they show on this paper. I can't promise that we'll get everything, but I think it will be better than on this paper. So for my money, um, setting a 51 cent municipal tax rate uh, puts us in a position where for the homestead with the school increase uh, and a 51 cent tax rate for the municipal side, it would be a two and a half percent increase. And for the uh, non-homestead side of things, if we left the tax rate at 51 cents, it would be about a 3.85% increase. Um, if we raise the full 55 cents that we're able to raise, it's about 4.3% on the homestead side and about 5.6%, 5.7% on the non-homestead side. Um, as I told you before, back in May, uh, I think there are a lot of people out there that are hurting. I think there are a lot of businesses that are gonna have a tough time. Um, and if we can give them this break, I appreciate that we end up um, holding the bag a little bit uh, with some of this money. But I think we as a municipality, given municipal finance law, are able to uh, withstand um, a deficit better than a lot of our taxpayers can. So my recommendation is the 51 cent municipal tax rate. And with that, I'll stop and let you ask questions, make comments, and then it's ultimately your decision. Or to have anything for Bill, Matt, Mark, can't see Nat and Mark, so that's why I'm asking them. The other two, Mike, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I took a look at Bill's uh, spreadsheets, you know, over dinner tonight. I know they came in at five o'clock, so didn't have a good long look at them, but I think everything's reasonable. I think, I think we need to be very cognizant with everything that's happening with COVID, with our business our population, with our residents hurting, I think being as conservative as we can be with a, with a 51% rate as Bill has recommended, I think that to me, that's the, the way to go. Well, it's kind of being liberal, Mike, in that we're, we're, I know. we're giving away money uh, to a degree. I understand what you're saying, but uh, I'm just half joking with you. I, I would echo that, Mark, uh, Mike. And um, I would say I, I agree with you, Bill. Um, I mean, in, in the business that I'm in, I'm seeing I'm seeing all of my costs. Um, I'm seeing all of my costs for everything that I do going up. Every single material that I use is going up day by day by day. Um, just because there's a massive shortage of materials out there, and I can't I can't just turn around and turn that into uh, a cost increase for my customer in the amount that I charge. And for somebody like me, um, it's a comfort to know that the tax rate is, would be the same as last year. It, it, you know, it's a baseline. It's a baseline for me. It's a, it's a you know, taxes are, as they say, inevitable. 
Um, but if I know that there's going to be a huge increase this year, that gives me a little cause for alarm. <laughs> so I think we owe it to, uh, I, I, I think, I think you're right, Bill. I think we owe it to the taxpayers to absorb a little and um, to kind of hold the line, as a lot of people are doing right now. People are holding the line. My two cents. Well, unfortunately, it has to come out of the, out in the wash somewhere. Um, you know, I'm going to say this, Bill. We've made some reasonable headway on our infrastructure. Last thing I want to see is start to fall back on that. Uh, well, we haven't, we have not proposed to uh, reduce, you know, certainly the paving. We're, we're going to do all the paving that we plan to do. We did delay the bridge project. Um, uh, but I think that, um, you know, I'm, I'm encouraged by the projections that I see because as I said, I'm thinking that some of the revenue that I've projected as lower is actually gonna come in a little bit higher. Um, you know, and I, I acknowledge right now, um, I think I told you the same thing back in May when I first made this proposal that, uh, you know, the goal is to help people survive through the present year. And then, you know, we'll see where we end up. Uh, we're gonna end up, you know, where we end up is where we're gonna end up. Um, and, uh, you know, we're giving a little bit away right now by, by setting a little bit lower tax rate. But I think that we're in a position that if we have to, we just move into next year and we, we have to say, to departments and other boards, you know, you're gonna have to do it a little bit less. I, I'm not suggesting that that all the cuts that we may have to uh, think about have been done already. I mean, I told you at the last meeting that we've called all the employees back. Um, I think we'll probably keep them all back for this year, given everything that we've got to do. Going forward, there's no there's no guarantees about anything. So, I think that uh, I'm just trying to provide a little bit of um, uh, buffer, if you will, to the taxpayer out there right now, and we'll worry about next year. Next year. Yeah. No, I I understand that. I just I still think you know uh, I'm still waiting for the other shoe to drop here. Um. You know, what are the likelihood of pilot getting pilot payments this year sounds even Teresa was nodding her head there a little bit that uh, meant that uh, we'll receive that money. We don't receive you know, we receive only 50% of that next year. Um, right. This all this federal money that's being put out right now loan that can continue to go on. Um, if come next year, that all kind of falls apart to some degree, you know, where's that going to leave us next year? Um, yeah, there, there's a lot of challenges ahead. And I think the, I think as far as pilot is concerned, I could almost guarantee you that next year's pilot payment will definitely be less. Um, I just don't think there's any way that uh, the, the local option tax from, um, you know, June from uh, July 1st this year through June 30th next year will be anywhere close to what it was a year ago, even with, um, you know, the fact that there were four or five months of declining revenue in our system this year. But um, we'll have to deal with it when we get to next year's budget. I mean, I'm getting mixed, mixed signals there on, on people in the economy and how they're doing. I mean, uh, Coming back from delivering a couple pieces of equipment to Marshfield yesterday, I drove by the two of the camper trailer sales and it was just loaded with people. Uh, from what I've heard, they're buying up campers. I, I hollered on the radio to my buddy there and said, uh, at the rate these campers are being bought up, there's not gonna be enough campgrounds to go around. Well, uh, right. people are buying, buying four wheelers or buying 
new vehicles. I don't know how many paper plates I've seen on the back of people, you know, people's brand new cars that they're buying. Uh, you're hearing that money to some people, their money's pouring out their ears and others are starving. Um, I guess my long and the short question here is, does the board have any stomach for any kind of a consideration go a little higher than 51 or do you want to stick at 51? I think you I'll echo. Either take the take the pain now or take the pain later, I guess is, is my, you know, I'm trying to mitigate worse pain later. I don't know. Yeah, I think I'm going to echo Bill's recommendation and, and suggest we go with 51 just to help ease any kind of impact others are facing right now because I think it is a mix. I think some people are doing well, but I think some are some others are, are really hurting, um, and I think we need to consider that. Okay. Chris, we don't know if uh, <clears throat> there will be pain later, and I'm hoping that it's not. I'm hoping that we do have see a rebound next year in the economy. You know, COVID kind of goes on the wane. You know, I can only be positive about that. But this year we have too many people, and I hear what you're saying. You know, I'm a fiscal conservative, but I think this is the wrong year. It's kind of like when we had Irene. We had a lot of people hurting right after Irene, and you, you wouldn't want to see big tax increases right after right after Irene, even though there was a lot of need and stuff to happen. I think now's just not the right time to have a tax increase. I hear you that some people are doing well. Some people. You know, there are certain parts of the economy that's doing excellent, but there are a lot of parts of the economy that are really hurting. And I think, you know, as a board, I I can only support Bill's recommendation for 51%. It gets us to where we need, and if we need to do something next year, next year we'll have to have some pain. And I agree with you. We don't, we don't, we're not deferring projects for the most part. We're getting things done. It's just we're going to run a little bit of a deficit. So, Bill, you know, Mike talking there just kind of brought something to my mind here. With the stock market going ridiculously crazy like it is, have we uh, have we gained uh, in our portfolios a substantial amount that would be worth, you know, skimming some off here a little bit before? Are you just? Well, I'll, I'll look at it again. Remember, though, um, I actually did sell uh, significant portions of our portfolio back in February when it was at the absolute high, and it was just dumb luck. I mean, I didn't know COVID was coming, but the stock market was at a pretty much all-time high. We had done very well, so I did sell off some then. And then we had a pretty precipitous drop from uh, you know March through June. Um, I didn't look at all of the portfolios today, but I did look at one and saw that, you know, our losses in that particular portfolio, which had been like $15,000 a couple months ago, now the loss was about $1,500. So it's come, it's come back up. I will certainly look at all that stuff. Um, and, you know, I'm not a big believer in market timing, but probably before the end of the year, we'd probably sell some, uh, some more of it. Um, you know, it sounds like the COVID situation is gonna get worse before it gets better. And uh, I was listening to something on the way down here tonight, and they were saying that, you know, the, the market tries to look ahead and, and the market has kind of envisioned that the legislature, the Congress, will eventually get something done as far as uh, another uh, uh, support system for, for the economy, for the unemployed and, and the like. So they're kind of banking on that it's going to be done, and that's why the market keeps going up. So I'll look at it and, and see what we can do. But um, I, I think that um, right now it looks like we're not going to have nowhere near as bad of a two years as we did in 2008 and 9 when 
when everything crashed through the bottom and stayed down there for quite a while. Okay, well, from the consensus that I'm hearing here, it's uh, 51 cents. Um, so rather than belabor it any further, if somebody'd like to make a motion to uh, put the tax rate at Bill's suggested 51 cents, we can get her done. I make a motion to set the tax, the town tax rate at 51 cents for uh, this fiscal year. I'll second. Any further discussion? No. Nope. And just, Karen, okay. uh, Mike, you'll agree that your motion includes setting the homestead and the non-homestead tax rates as, as dictated by the state, right? Absolutely. Okay, thanks. All right, uh, all those who wish to approve this motion, say aye. 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 Passes. Okay, that's the pain for tonight. Fees for copies of documents. Yeah, this sounds like pretty foolish to even talk about after just talking about millions of dollars of taxes, but um, we are living in a situation where our office is still closed and looks like given the guidance that we're getting in terms of having to take down all kinds of contract contact tracing information and everything else, that will probably remain closed except by appointment only for the foreseeable future. And, uh, you know, people call and they want copies of certain things. And as I indicated in the memo that I sent you or the email that I sent you, there's a couple of things that uh, there are prescribed fees by state statute that Carla has to, to go by. Uh, and then we also have a, a fee that we kind of piggyback, that, piggyback on that for listener cards and tax, tax uh, bills. Uh, but if people call up now and they, you know, they want their zoning uh, file sent to them, um, we're just asking that the select board authorize us to charge uh, 25 cents a page for that. I, I sent a, I didn't remember to print out the, uh, the email that I sent you. So there's a motion there that if somebody still has that in front of them can be made and we'll be all set. I can have it in front of me if you want me to do it. Yes, sure. go ahead, please. I move the fee for copies of public documents other than those already set pertaining to town clerk records, lister cards, and tax bill be set at 25 cents per page, whether the copies are physical or electronic. In addition, if physical copies are sent by U.S. mail, the postage costs will be added. Good job, Katie. Almost thought, you'd almost thought you read that. Yeah. There's a second to that motion, please. A second that. Okay, not. Any further discussion? Don't believe so. So all that wish to approve that motion. Oh, Mike's got a question. Just quickly, and Bill may know this. Uh, do we have any fees for notary services? Karen shaking her head no. Karen shaking her head no. Okay, just curious. No. <laughs> And right now we're we're pushing those services off to other people for the most part anyway. Okay, thank so, you. Car I'm sorry, Carla did start taking appointments this week for notary, excuse me, last week for notary services. So just began that again. Right. Thanks, Karen. Okay, motion's been made and seconded. Uh, all those in favor say aye, please. Aye. 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 Okay. Last item on the uh, agenda. Issues for consideration for our next meeting. And we already have one. Yeah, well, for future meetings, it says, it doesn't necessarily mean the next meeting, but um, there's a couple of issues that have come up. You heard about the one tonight with regard to the uh, encampment up there across from uh, Thatcher Brook. 
Uh, I wanted to make sure that you knew about that. I'll try to work with the state police and get something done there. I'll, I'll look at the uh, village's old ordinance for discharging firearms and see if there's something that we can do with that. Um, but I, I'm pretty confident, Chris, that there is no ability to pass an ordinance that just says, you know, you can't camp. We can, we can prohibit camping on municipal land, uh, and, and then we can issue notices of no trespass if it's land that the town owns. But just having a blanket ordinance that's saying it's illegal to be homeless, I don't think we can do that. Um, a couple of other issues that have come up, just in case you hear about them. Um, I've had a couple of phone calls last week about uh, the uh, an incident of rats down on South Main Street, down in the vicinity of uh, where Napa is. Um, evidently, some people down there had chickens and were feeding the chickens grain and you know, the river's right there, and I think it's been attractive to the rodents. Um, I went down there today to try to, to, to see what I could find. I didn't see anything. I did tell the um, one of the women who called me that the mere presence of rats does not uh, indicate a public health hazard, and the town only has authority to deal with um, through the town health officer with public health uh, issues. Um, a number of years ago, I think, Chris, you were on the board, but we had a big rat problem on Stowe Street, um, and uh, we spent a lot of money. We spent about $10,000 trying to deal with that situation. It was a unique situation, not like this one. But if you hear about it, I am looking into it. I'm doing what I can do, but it's not clear that we have uh, major authority. And I told the person, I said, it sounds to me like you need to get an exterminator and you need to get them to come into your house and, and deal with it. Uh, you're only gonna get rid of them if you get rid of the king and queen rat, basically. And uh, unless you get into their den, it's hard to do that. Um, we have another issue uh, down on um, Little River Road. People there are starting to call because a former home that was owned and maybe still listed to a guy by the name of Sanborn. It's the first house on the left after you go under the interstate bridges going down to Little River. It's uh, an abandoned home. I think the person who owns it is in jail. Uh, it's pretty dilapidated. Um, <clears throat> for whatever reason, the bank continues to pay the taxes on it. So we've never been able to put it up for tax sale. I have sent letters to the bank <laughs> asking them to, you know, board it up to secure the property to no avail. Uh, somebody has just moved a camper into that yard outside that home. And uh, there's people down at Little River who are a little bit concerned about that. I drove down there today. I did not uh, see anyone. So um, I'll look into that as well. Um, that used to be Charlie, Charlie uh, Ashley's house, the one that burnt. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, I think that's it. Um, Oh, and your, your issue, Chris. Yeah, I did uh, have a call from a resident the other day interested in possibly looking at some guidelines uh, in reference to Airbnbs and uh, trying to restrict the uh, hell raising, I guess, that's going on in some of these Airbnbs. Um, I guess there's been 45 complaints on one particular place up on Perry Hill and uh, you know, there's others that have had to call cops to uh, intervene to stop the midnight ruckus. Um, yeah. um, we can uh, perhaps take a look at what we can do to nip that in the bud as well. 
Anything else from the rest of the board? Concerns? They're all happy, happy. I'm all set. The, right. only thing, the only thing, as I mentioned earlier, that the Blush Hill access, there still continues to be issues up there. And I don't know, you know, people parking in the trailer turnaround spaces. And <clears throat> it's just, I don't know, maybe we, we need the state police up there more frequently. You know, I, I'd well, like to say. State police won't write tickets like for that kind of thing. They, they told us from the beginning, but you know it's it's much. I find it's much better than it than it has been. I I was up there on Thursday afternoon, up there until about four thirty, quarter of five. But there was no one parked on the side of the road going down to the down to the reservoir. There were some people that were you know the. Problem is, some people just consider it in terms of how they park down at the turnaround itself. Um, they really shouldn't leave large trailers down there. People just kind of park every which way down there, and and it's just hard to negotiate. But I think it's much better than it was in the springtime when when everybody and their brother was out there. No, you're right. That it, that's the parking on the side where no parking i think has kind of uh adjusted itself i know i i particularly left a message someone was parked in that turnaround area and they they were there and i came back five hours later and the car was there still parked right in front of the no parking sign and i've seen that a few times and especially for those of us that have boats it makes it very difficult to turn around boats and i I know we probably have a very difficult time to administer tickets or something like that. And I even called the state police and said, well, you should have called when we were there, when, when you were right there and they might've come right down. And I probably will do that next time. Okay. I, I've gotten several um, emails and voicemails from my friends uh, who have boats that, um, they're pretty much all water skiers and they set the water skiing course down there. And um, I've encouraged them to, in a non-confrontational way, leave a note. Say, exactly. say, here's my cell phone number. I would like to teach you how to be a better user. <laughs> and just, you know, try to try to get some form of communication going um, and to try to get people talking to other people that maybe they just don't know any better. Maybe they just don't have the common sense it takes to know that their gigantic pickup truck with their massive trailer sticking out in the road one foot beyond the next car is a big problem. And just, you know, get an open line of communication going and, and let's get back to civility and let's talk to each other. And we call ourselves adults. Well, we try to. You know, education is, uh, we're wearing out this definition of education. At some point, you you got to have a clue. I've said, right. I've said that to people too. When I'm up there, you know, you say it in a very polite way. Say, you know, this is, they say, oh, we're just here for just a very short time. We're going to be picking up our kayaks or something like that. I say, it's a really difficult time when boats are trying to turn around that you're here. I know it would be great if you could just, you know, move to another area. And they were very nice. And, you know, the people were from Shelburne and, you know, not from out of state or anything. And they were just very respectful. And I think, as Nat says, you need to educate people. That's the really key. Yeah, and you don't need to be a jerk about it. I mean, exactly. you don't need to. You don't leave, need to leave notes that say, "Hey, stop being a blah blah blah." You need to just talk to people, educate them. Yeah, we all want to share the lake together, right? Exactly. Okay, people. It's been nice visiting with you again, but uh, I haven't eaten since ten o'clock this morning, and <laughs> overdue. So if somebody wants to make a motion to adjourn, we can all go and do our own thing. So moved. Thanks.
Second. 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 All right. Adios, people. Until next time. Thank you. Bye.